I who had her sermon today was a woman who walks bent over. And the person answered. Yeah, I identify with her more than you know. Mm -hmm. She was chatting. Right, babe? We all have that. Uh, I do, too, but I got gotcha. you. <laughs> we all do that. The women bent over, I, I understand her more than you think, right? I mean, you brought that out. That yeah. came out in your, yeah, that in your was, sermon. That was good because yeah. I, I didn't always focus on so much that it was a spiritual thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always yeah. It, uh, it, it really, I, I, you know, it was short and brief and to the point, but it was really had a lot of application for us. Yeah. I thought it was very good at that that healing, that miracle. All right, we're going to start, even though nobody, you know, it is what it is. We're going to start. Um, all right. So first things first. This is the Good Friday service. So this is if you want to sign up for this, I'll pass this around. If you want to read, you know, you might as well sign up and read. So all you have to do is, is put your name, a highlight where you can where you can read. So you can just put your name in there. So Mitch, you'll want to read. I want you to do me a favor if you'd be willing. Yeah. Put my name wherever your the spirit tells you. Okay. To put. I'll Thank do you. That. Thank you. I really appreciate that. You'll be very happy. I'm always happy. Whatever you do. Mitch, you just got to, is it T H A L E R? That's the just, make sure, just make sure I spelled it right. Okay. So I'm going to pass this around, whoever wants to read. And Mitch, you'll see your name's already on there. Thank you. Did you want to read? You probably want to look to see where your name is. Okay, everybody. Wow. I'll do that. Well, you got my name right. Um, did you want to read? And then bring it, um, hand it back to me, and I'll go this way. All right, everybody. We're going to start earlier today. Thank you for coming up early. I know it's. You still technically have 10 minutes or 50, whatever, but we've got a lot to accomplish and I want to get through this because I want to be able to spend time on this test. Like I want to be able to spend the whole class on a test at least. Good. Yeah, it's a nice test. So I'm passing around. You guys are getting first dibs on the Good Friday reading because it's a great, have you ever been to the Good Friday service? Yes. Has anybody ever been to the Good Friday? It's a very yeah. good service. It's, amazing. it's candlelight. It's very quiet. It's 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 the songs are not like these big worship songs. It's more of a thoughtful uh, day and the reading. So you can read. You can pick a portion of. There's probably enough. I mean, if I'm giving it to you first because you guys are always here and faithful. Here. So uh, pick out a portion that you can read it for Good Friday. It's a good service. Don't forget, we have to do Psalm 18. Yeah, we're not going to do that. Oh, we're gonna, we're yeah, gonna that you go? know what? It's it's um, okay. in preparations. It, it was so long; it took too long. I've got to get through Hebrews. That's I mean, fine. That's, we, we, be, and we've got to do chapter 10 today and chapter 12. That way, I can do briefly 13 next week and then get into the test because the review is the whole course, you know. And I want to be able to spend time with you guys on that. All right. Right. Next week, our last class? No, no, no. We have two more, right? Two more. Next week and then the week after. So now we're going to. All right. So why don't we do this? As this is going around, can we do two things at once or no? Yes. As this thing goes around, we've read we've read chapter 10 already. So let's go to chapter 12. We did chapter 11. So let's read chapter 12, and then um, and then we'll I'll lecture on uh, 10 and 12. It'll be a little bit odd. But I'll lecture on 10 and 12. I don't know why it's 10 and 13. But 10 and 12. No, 10. Yeah, 10 and 12. I did 11. And then 13 we'll do next week if we don't have time. But we can get through this. These, these chapters are not, uh, they're not very complicated. Right. So why don't we start, if you, if you want to read, you can read. We'll read one verse. Each person would read one verse. So we'll start in uh, chapter 12. And if you don't want to read, just say pass, and then the people next to you read. You want to start? Okay. Mitch, why don't you start then? 
uh, God disciplines his sons. Hebrews chapter 12. Each, Everybody read one verse. It's okay. Take your time. Okay, God disciplines his sons. Yeah, yeah. Verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do you not make light do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Wow. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the fire of our spirits and So back to me. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms <coughs> and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the many may not be disabled, but the other do. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral <clears throat> or is godless like Esau, <clears throat> who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, <coughs> as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to the trumpet of blast, or such a voice speaking words that those who heard it say that no further word was spoken to them. Because they could not bear, bear what was commanded, <coughs> even if even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. To the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteousness, men made perfect to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook, shook the earth, <clears throat> but now he has promised once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. 
Let me go back to chapter 10. Let's see how long chapter 10 is. Um, it's probably worth reading this again, um, even though I really wanted to get through it. But um, why don't, Mitch, why don't we start and read chapter 10, and we'll, we'll just that way we get this on the books again. Because it's probably been a while since you, you've read it. Okay. Okay. So that's subtitled, um, Christ sa Sacrificed Once for All. Right. Oh, I remember this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hope so. That's the whole purpose of the whole <laughs> course is right there. <laughs> <laughs> he gets an A, right? <laughs> so well, I won't go with the plus, but I'll go with the plus. <laughs> I'll accept it. So, verse 1, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never be the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year. Make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and an offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, The sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who would have insulted the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed 
to insult and persecution. At other times, she stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathize with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourself had a better and lasting position. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Okay, that's good. All right, so let me, let's do this. Um, I, I want to kind of map this out for you, because there's a lot in there, and it's, it's, it's very important. It's really, it really summarizes much of what we're doing. So there, there's two concepts in juxtaposition to one another that you probably didn't see, but it's, we all know the once for all, right? We all know that now, right? Which is really the whole theme of, the book of Hebrews, that Jesus' sacrifice was once for all. But it's in juxtaposition to, what is it in juxtaposition to? And the answer is there. It's very good. The, the priest that had to continually sacrifice. Okay. What, what, what is that? What, what term is used? It's really quite good. It goes hand in hand with once and for all. You didn't see it? I thought it was week after week. Day after day. You're all warm. You're warm. When I write it, you're going to kick yourself. Do you want me to write it or you want to take another minute? Right. Right. You want me to write it? Yeah. Okay, so my question to you is we have this once and for all. We know what that stands for, that Christ's sacrifice was done once for all. It did not have to be replicated. It can't be replicated, it can't be reproduced, and it's unnecessary that it ever happened again. His sacrifice on the cross, once for all, right? We're going to explain that in our own words on the exam. So this is in juxtaposition or opposite of what would be the other phrase. How's that? I gave you a clue, a key phrase. It's right there. I have come to you endlessly. Nope. Sacrifice and offering. Is that in scripture? Again and again. Is that in there? Yeah, somebody said it. Yeah, it's in there. Verse 11. It's key. So verse 11 is really key to explain the difference between the old. So this, again and again, represents the old, the old covenant, and this is the new. So, so now you have this, now you have a good understanding of uh, the concept of again and again versus once and for all. Do you see how beautiful that is? Yep. Now you should have saw that though. So what does again and again mean? Now I know you all know what that means. What does this mean? Continually. Continually. And what is it referencing? I, I have an idea what it's referencing. Um, that it's covering the sins. It's not washing them away. Okay. Well it's covering, it's covering four things. The sacrifices, right? Right? They have to do the sacrifices again and again. The burnt offerings, right? Isn't this what it's talking about? Yes. Isn't that what the priests do? The sacrifices, the burnt offerings, the sin offerings, right? Right? The sin offerings. And then the issue was that it wasn't, wasn't permanent. Right? It wasn't permanent. They have to keep on doing this again and again. And they would have to do it again and again. And they would have to do it repetitiously because it wasn't fully efficacious. Right? So this is fully, once and for all, fully efficacious. Fully efficacious to forgive sin. So once and for all concept is fully efficacious to forgive sin, whereas the old covenant was again and again. So you have again and again versus once and for all. Do you like that? Yes. 
So that's really all I'm doing here is creating a concept that's already in there and just pulling out, putting words to the concept, right? Uh, you probably can't understand my writing. What do you have? So this is sacrifice, sacrifice, burn offering, sin offering, and it wasn't permanent. It had to be done again and again, right? This is the old. Versus the new, that is fully efficacious to forgive sin once for all. So those are the those are the real important things that are found in uh, that are found in chapter ten. Now there's some some other things that are important. The, the, I'm going to start. The last section talks about the martyrs, right? Do you see where that is or no? Do you see where the martyrs are mentioned in Hebrews chapter ten or no? I'm jumping around a bit a, a little bit because I'm contemplating trying to get through this. But toward the end of the Toward the end of Hebrews chapter 10, it talks about those that have been suffered, those that have been persecuted. Do you see that? Yeah. It really starts from like 32. It goes to 37 in that section there. That's really two sections in there. It's the martyrs that have been uh, persecuted for Christ, right? And it also talks about the second advent. Do you see that toward the end or no? Am I just making things up, yes, or is it here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so that last, the last portion of Hebrews chapter ten contemplates the martyrs. It says, "Remember those earlier days after you received the light, when you stood your ground in the great contest in the face of suffering, being publicly exposed, insulted, persecuted, right? Mm -hmm. Those that were in prison at all, to a confiscation of property. I mean, look at these things could come back again someday. Amen. Yeah. Let me tell you." So it, it contemplates the martyrs, it contemplates those that were sac you know were suffering for the gospel, and then always, man, it just it follows kind of, you know, the second advent that you know you'll be rewarded when Christ comes again. So these are kind of like they're they're not real big concepts in Hebrews, but nevertheless they're there and we wanted to address it. Any questions, guys? You following you following that or no? I know I'm going fast. Okay. So now let's kind of go back to the, the body of uh, chapter 10. So we, we talked about that the sin, all the, the sin and the offerings were not effective, not effective to fully and permanently forgive sin. And then meaning forgive sin and have restoration to God. Restoration to God. That was the Achilles heel of the old. I'll, I'll just put here the Achilles heel of the old covenant. That it was not effective to fully and permanently forgive sin and have that uh, relationship restored to God. So that's what Hebrews chapter 10 stands for. Now it also raises a very interesting question and it, it relates to Holy Saturday or what happened on Saturday which I'm not going to get I'm not going to get into too much now but I just want to raise that question for you because it seems that there's a foreshadowing of some sort here of I'm not going to say it's a way of salvation because we know see this is interesting and this is what I'm going to talk about on Holy Saturday we know the way of what is the only way to salvation? Through Jesus Christ and the cross. Well, you all agree with that? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so the, the only way of salvation is Jesus Christ, right? So now, <laughs> this becomes a theological problem for us as it relates to the Old Testament, right? I mean, because the argument would be, if, if Jesus is the only way of salvation, which it is, we have to stay with that and we have to work through that. So my suggestion is possibly, look at the little clue that the writer of Hebrews gives us. Let me ask you this, and this is a very difficult question. There's two verses in Hebrews chapter 11 that reference this particular theological problem. Do you have any idea of where they would be? Two verses that raise this issue. It's right in front of you. So my question is this, that we all agree that the way of salvation is, let me ask you this question, is there anybody in heaven that is in heaven that didn't receive Christ as Lord and Savior? 
Yes. Who would that be? Well, prior to his uh, Abraham and those those. I don't know. I'm not so sure. Well, they looked forward to his coming. Okay. But it wasn't. It wasn't well, a finished I mean, I, thing I, I, You know, I, I don't. I, I don't know. I don't know. As thirteen says, <clears throat> all these people were still living by faith when they died. Mm -hmm. uh, they only yeah. saw the promises and welcomed yeah. them from a distance. Right. So they didn't quite understand. No, that's all. That's all. That's all. That's all right. So, mm -hmm. so what what verses are you reading from? Um, thirteen. Uh, thirteen. No, no, no. She's not reading from thirteen. Yeah. Where, where are you reading I, I from? I just turned it over. Okay. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, let, let me let me make this easy for you. Let's look at verse twenty-seven and twenty-eight. Look, we have to deal with. That's all true. And that's one of the issues that's raised on, on Holy Saturday, or, or the Saturday before the resurrection, and we'll talk about this on, on, on the Saturday in particular, is that, look, at my Bible says that the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. So I've got to struggle with that, right? So my question is, is that we have here, well, what about the people that died before Jesus came to earth? And so that's, that's the right answer, that, you know, they looked forward to the Messiah, but really, in particular, the writer of Hebrews says something a little bit different. Look at verse 27 and 28. It says, But only a fearful expectation of judgment, which you talked about, and a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So it, it's suggesting at least that what those people had to do prior to the coming of Christ was abide in the laws that God had given, the commandments, right? Mm -hmm. So at least this was what they had to do, and if they died, and there was no testimony of two people saying, yes, this person was righteous, they abide in the laws, you know, they were lost. Now the question is, what happened at that point in time, we don't necessarily know. Right. It could be related to Holy Saturday, possibly, when Jesus went and preached. You don't know? Very, a very difficult and complex question. But see, my theory, which I can tell you kind of now a little bit, but I wanted to save until Saturday, was that that if if it is true that no one can enter heaven unless they professed Jesus Christ as Lord, the issue is the Old Testament saints, right? So where are they? Are they able to enter heaven without professing Jesus Christ as Lord? It may very well be that that Saturday, in between the crucifixion and the resurrection, the Old Testament saints saw the fulfillment of everything they believed in Jesus Christ on that Saturday, and then at that point in time, they ascended into heaven. Go ahead. Says in the Bible that he took the captives out with him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so you know, look, it's it's one of those questions that is really very, very difficult, and we probably can't come to a consensus. At least the theologians can't. But I I like to always have my rules of engagement, and if you break the rule of engagement that people can get into heaven without acknowledging Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it, it becomes it becomes theological problematic. You, you follow that issue that you would have? Mm -hmm. So is the, my question theologically would be, is there a way that satisfies those rules of God? And Saturday may be that very day. Mm -hmm. Now, look, it, you have to be careful because that's high theology. It's very complicated, <coughs> and there's a lot of nuances that go with it. That's why my disclaimer is, when we have chapel on Saturday, we're going to discuss these things as, as we have. But I'm not going to tell you, you know, anything is definitive. It's for you to figure out for yourself. But certainly, you either have to have the position that there's another way to get to heaven. If you're an Old Testament saint and you looked forward to, to the Messiah and you obey the laws and you believe that by doing that you'll receive eternal life, then that, that's fine, right? But, but, but me being more critical would stay to the position that one has to acknowledge Christ as Lord and Savior before they can enter heaven, if that's, that's the key to heaven. I mean, that's, that's the only way, right? So if that's the only way, then there has to be a conduit for the Old Testament saints to be able to be part of that and, and, and receive you know, eternal life. So it could be 
that Jesus, on that Saturday, went down and said, here I am, and those that believed and professed receive eternal life. It's radical. It's, it's probably, you've probably never heard that before, but it's something that I've been struggling with for years now, trying to figure out the consistency of it all. So, so this is what I wanted to kind of talk about. So verse 27 and 28 are very important, but, but they're not the typical once for all and again and again. So I wanted to talk about that. And I think that that's pretty much enough for you as far as chapter 10 is concerned. Now, I'm going to say, do you have any questions? Don't you, just don't make them too hard for me. Do you have any questions or comments? I mean, I'm only kidding. This is not easy. This is this would be this is would be Ph, PhD level analysis and discussion. This is a discussion we would have, and and they'd probably be uh, just as uh, lost, if not more lost, than you guys. Go ahead. I, I just think uh, I want to see what you think about it. That the way I always looked at it. Yeah. The, the Old Testament, it was a covering. Those sins were covered like they were hidden. But they weren't taken away permanently the way Jesus does them that's once and for all. Well, you're exactly right. You're 100% right. See, I learned that from you. But that's again and again, right? It's again and again. Yeah. So so you're, you're not right. And then I just kind of try to figure it out for myself that, you know, sun, Saturday is very problematic because there's about seven or eight scriptures, and this is one of them, that contemplate what Jesus may be doing on Saturday. It's, it's something that's never talked about. Because it, it, it's shaded and cloaked in secrecy and darkness. But, you know, the answers are there if you, if you look hard enough for it. I think that my argument on Saturday is a very good theologically strong argument. I mean, it's not going to be accepted by everybody. People are going to have a pro problem with it. But, 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 uh, but I, can, I think I can go head-to-head -head with anybody on that challenge and say, hey, listen, if, 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 if once I get you to answer this question, the only way of salvation is through Jesus Christ. Once I get people to commit to that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, no one enters to the Father but through the Son. See, I can pull out all the scriptures and justify my position, and it's going to be a very hard position to override. But like I said, it's not, it's not a very accepted theological interpretation by, by the early church or theologians. I, you know, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's, it's a little bit nuanced, so... That's the difficulty of, of, of all this, but uh, you, you understand it pretty much, right? I mean, the one thing I want you to understand is if you come away with something from chapter 10, all you really have to know is again and again versus once for all. And if you understand that concept, you, you really understand all of Hebrews. I mean, if you understand again and again versus once for all, then the class has been a success, Dane. I was just going to ask you, so like when we read in the Old Testament where they would bring... Like if they commit adultery, they bring a grain offering. Or the, people don't do that anymore. No. So they must have adopted in some sort of way that Jesus came and... Well, it depends on who you're talking with. I mean, yeah, if you're I talking guess. with Orthodox Jews... They still have to go. They, you know, look at they. Sacrifices haven't been, you know, they're doing other things right yeah. now, right? But sacrifices have haven't been reinstated yet. It can't be reinstated until the temple is built, right? I mean, technically they could do sacrifices, mm -hmm. but they're not really, they're not sufficient. They're not even sufficient for their own law. Mm -hmm. Got to build the temple. That's why they're assembling the temple, right? They're assembling the the, the bits and pieces to build the temple, or they're just going to take something else over. I don't want to get in politically into anything, but, you know, it's, it's scripturally, it's, if these things are prophetic. But, um, go ahead. Uh, are, are you using that, because that sounds plausible, what you said. Well, are you saying that when he led captivity captive, when he led them out, that those were the Old Testament yeah. saints that he led? Proclaimed, here I am. This is what you were. <laughs> and most of them said, yes, that you're, yeah. that's it. And then there could be some that said, well, I don't believe it, you know. But yeah, but yeah, that's what I'm proposing. It's a theory. Yes. Well, yeah, I, I, I was taught that, um, you know, they waited in Abraham's bosom, and then that those are the people that he took out. Well, look, him. you can see, you yeah. can see where these. You can see where this purgatory stuff comes into play, right? Yeah. Where, right? But you know, but look at you, you buying, you putting money in the in the in the tip jar. Is not going to get anybody out of purgatory? I mean, it's it's just, and, and purgatory is technically a holding place for those that have sinned that haven't been 
you know, relieved of that sin yet. So it's it's really kind of a it's, it's kind of. A, I thought it was that, and then Jesus. That's those are the ones that Jesus took up. What yeah, yeah. I, I would argue no. no. I would argue. I mean, my theory would be that those righteous Old Testament well, saints. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The righteous okay. Old Testament okay, saints. Yeah, I didn't mean everybody. But but you're you're asking. You know, it, it's so hypothetical, right? I mean, you understand it. But I, I think that it's plausible, and I think it's a good. I think it's a good theory. Um, and I think it could hold. It could hold. I, I can hold weight in a debate with somebody on that theory, Melissa. I have a question. Um, Twenty-eight. It says anyone who rejected the law of yeah. Moses. Yeah. So back in that time, there would have been people in other places that would have never heard the law of Moses. So they, act, to me, rejection is an active thing that you say, oh, I don't go along with that. But there's people that I would think that are in whatever. <clears throat> They're in the grave that never heard the law of Moses. And if they would have accepted Jesus when he went down there, that they would have went too because the thief on the cross I was agree. not a Jew. I agree. And yeah. he was not a believer, but he told Jesus, yeah. I believe. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, that, that's kind of a hypothetical, but yeah, that, that works. I mean, that works. So it's not so yeah. much about being righteous, but believing in Jesus. Well, I mean, they're interchangeable, right? You know, that they're the, the, the righteous Old Testament saints. You're saying that somebody had never heard of anything and was isolated and then was in that particular area when Jesus came and received. Yeah, I mean, it's not really it, it's not really what it's possible. I'm not you know, I don't know. But it's, this is really this is really referencing those Old Testament saints of God. In, uh, in Israel. Could it be applicable to others? I'm sure it could be. You know, if somebody, because there could be Old Testament people that were there that rejected when Jesus came, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. just as, uh, just as he, they could have rejected that, which would be foolish, right? You're sitting there waiting, he comes, and then you reject it. But, because I think there's some language that says those that, those that heard and believed. So yeah. it, it suggests to me that those heard that didn't believe right. too. So there's, there's room for that. But, but the concept, I think, look, this is, this is kind of like the course in, in, in a short period of time, right? But but good, it's good, good, good stuff, guys. Good stuff. All right, let's move on now. Let let's move on. You, you, that, that's the heart of the that's the heart of the lesson, heart of the class. But I just want you to remember again and again, verses once for all. All right. Now let's go to chapter twelve. I have a little bit of time. That's wrong, right? That yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> It was right. right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm thinking to myself, I have a lot of time with you guys now. You know? But I'll get through this. I'll get through all my stuff. It's just very important that we look at this course. We have to get through this course and these chapters, and we have to be able to do this test. Uh, you know, so it's, it's important that we kind of get through. That's why I'm, I dispense with the Psalms. But Hebrews chapter 12, let's kind of outline this together. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, there's just a lot in here. But let's try to, let's talk about, um, there's maybe... You know, what we can do is, okay, I'm going to ask you guys this. I'm going to, be, I'm going to make it a little bit hard for you, so, so you can learn something. Harder. Yeah, harder. Uh, but, so, so, like I did here, there's, there's two things, there's two items in juxtaposition to one another. Do you know what, do you know what when I say that, do you know what I mean by that? Yes. yes. What do I mean by that? Two items that oppose each other. Yeah, exactly. exactly. At the same yeah. time. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, good. Okay. So so let's do this. What two things in chapter twelve are in juxtaposition to one another? You should know this because it's 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 in there clearly in there. What two what is the what is the writer in Hebrews comparing here? There's two items that he's comparing. What do you think it would be? Anybody know? Take a guess. There's two kind of... How do I give you clues without telling you the answer? There, there's two entities that are, that are waging against each other. What's the Old Testament stand for? You guys know this. What's the Old Testament stand for? The Mosaic Law. Yeah, the law, right? So you have the law, right, on one side. And what do you have in juxtaposition to the law? Faith. Well, grace, right? It would be grace, grace faith. But it'd be, it'd be, I don't want to give you all the answers. You know, it's the gospel, right? Right? 
So you have the law versus the gospel, right? Or not? Yeah. What is that reflective of? The, there's, there's things that kind of signify the law, and there's something that signifies the gospel. Do you guys know what that is? It says it right in here. You guys have to read more carefully. It says it right in 12. Okay. Does anybody know Mount Sinai? You see that? <coughs> yes or no? Yeah. You know, Mount Sinai is referenced in chapter 12, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm asking questions that I know the answer to, but I want you to, I want you to go along with me here. And then what other mount is reflected in, in Hebrews chapter 12? Mount Zion? Yeah. Okay. So, see, Mount Sinai is standing for the law and all that it is, right? When you hear Mount Sinai, that's where Moses got the law. So Mount Sinai is reflective of the old. So the law would be the old covenant, right? Old covenant. And Mount Zion, that always contemplates heavenly Jerusalem, and that contemplates the gospel in at least Hebrews chapter 12. So you have Mount Sinai signifying the new covenant, right? So you have these things, and now you have all these elements. Okay, so what? let's go through the elements, because they're all listed in Scripture. Let's go through the elements of Mount Sinai. What are the elements or the characteristics of Mount Sinai? Can you list them all for me? Go through them one at a time? Am I reading a different, am I lecturing on a different chapter than you guys are reading? No. Okay, all right. I just wondered. Okay, so that means to tell me, you, you, didn't, you read chapter 10 and 11, you didn't really read 12. That's okay. But do we have blazing fire? Let me ask you this. If an animal, if an animal touched the mountain, what would happen? Yeah. It must be stone. Stone, okay. All right. So what what was what did this what are the characteristics of this mountain? Do you know? Do you know what they are? I mean I've got I wrote down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? Seven characteristics. How about this? Blazing fire, is that good? Yeah. Is that there? I just want to write down what's there. <coughs> darkness. Okay. Gloom. Blazing fire. Darkness. Gloom and storm. Gloom and storm. What else? Blazing fire, darkness, gloom, tempest. Right? Tempest? Yes? Mm -hmm. What about a trumpet? A trumpet, a trumpet blast. Right? Mm -hmm. What else? Very interesting. What about the voice? Yeah. The voice, right? How was that voice? How did how did the Israelites re relate to that voice when they heard that voice? The trumpet blast. Well, I'm not talking about the trumpet. I'm or talking about the voice. The voice speaking that they they were so fearful they didn't want to even talk to God. They're like, you, <laughs> Moses, you you do this. We're not doing this, right? Go ahead. So an animal could not touch it. It was untouchable. A blazing fire, darkness, gloom, and storm, tempest, a trumpet, and a voice, which was God's voice, right? So this, there's, I think there's one other that I missed. What else did I, I miss there? Anything else? I think there's one more that I missed. Okay. No, I got it all. So, so this signify, signifies earth in a way. This is the earthly temple. Okay? So this is all under the, the old covenant. Now let's go to the new covenant. What are the characteristics of the new covenant? It says it here, right? This heavenly Jerusalem, right? Does it say that? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm, 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 I'm reiterating, because I have my notes and I did this a week ago. It has the city of the living God, right? City of the living God. Right? What else? Thousands of angels. Angels, right? The angels. In joyful assembly. Right, that's the church. Right. Church is so important. Look, the people, when you have a day like today and the clocks are all broken and nobody shows up to church, the church isn't important. It's so important to your life as a Christian. I know. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be the best of churches, but it's church. You go there and you could learn and you could read and you could study and you could 
worship and assemble, right? Church is important. What else is there? God. Well, yeah, church, God is there, right? Well, I'm talking about real church, right? Authentic, real. Not a made-up church. <clears throat> what happens under the New Covenant? Men made perfect, right? Through the sacrifice of Christ. Also, Jesus is the mediator, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus is the mediator. Wow. What else we have? New covenant. And then what's the one last thing I'm not going to give you the answer to? What's the one element that makes this all right? Do not refuse him. The blood. The blood. The blood. <laughs> right? And this blood is the blood of Christ, right? It's different than it's different than this stuff, right? Blood of Christ. So so chapter 12 really encourages you because the introduction of it, this is the meat of it is, you know, the old versus the new and the characteristics, but it's it's encouragement to live life without sin for Christ, right? And if we do sin, we're forgiven. But we, we, we want to avoid, you know, we want to avoid that. And the encouragement here is a cloud of witnesses, right? The cloud of witnesses of all the righteous that live before us. So the cloud of witnesses encourage us to live this life, right? Not this life that is again and again. See, this is again and again. Right? This is again and again versus once for all. Do you see how beautiful when you analyze, come in, Pastor, when you analyze the book of Hebrews and you, you lay it all out, how it just flows perfectly together, again and again versus once for all. And then under those again and again, you have all these other, all those old, if you went through the book of Hebrews, the whole, the whole book, you can have two columns, again and again, and once for all, and you can put everything in one of those two columns. Because that's what the whole book is. It's, it's a dissertation and explanation of the old covenant versus the new covenant. I mean, that's, that's where it's at. And this depicts, this depicts the earthly, the earthly kingdom, and this is the heavenly kingdom. All right. So, Pastor, we just we basically just outlined. We did. I did ten and twelve together because there was there was more consistency with ten and twelve. Eleven was kind of it was kind of like stuck in there a little bit. So, what I did was I did eleven last week, and then we did ten and eleven now. And what we just learned was there's two concepts in juxtaposition that really the writer of Hebrews explains this to us in chapter ten. It's the concept of again and again. Versus once for all. And and we can probably put everything in those two categories. I mean, everything in the book of Hebrews is again and again versus once for all. And so we just, we outlined in chapter 12, it had a beautiful uh, char characterization of the old covenant versus the new covenant. We've laid this all out. And so this is, this is the new covenant is fully efficacious to forgive sin, whereas... The old covenant was ineffective to not, you know, it was not effective to fully and permanently forgive sin and restoration to God. So we basically covered all that, and I threw in a little bit of a monkey wrench as it, as it relates to Holy Saturday, which you didn't hear, but the class heard, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this on Saturday, because there's actually some relation uh, in Hebrews chapter where did I say, guys, where was that? Was that in chapter 12? Or was it in chapter 10? It's ch chapter 10. Okay. Yeah, so I think that that's, that's all. I've accomplished what I set out to do. Uh, so do you have any questions? Go ahead. I do. Yeah. Um, in 24. What, 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 which which uh, book? Um, 10 or 12? 12. 12? 12? 12? 12, 24. Okay. I'm curious about that 
Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Yeah. Can you explain that, the blood of I, Abel? I absolutely can. I mean, look, it, I, I would start with the other way first, that whatever the blood of Abel signifies, and Abel's blood signifies innocent blood being shed. So Abel, Abel always, anytime Abel is mentioned, Abel was innocent and righteous, right? So, so Abel's blood was shed, and it was innocent blood that was shed. Well, Jesus' blood was innocent blood that was shed. But, see, my theory works. You can put Abel, you can put Abel in here, right? Abel's blood, right? Abel's blood is not effective to fully and permanently forgive sin. But Jesus' blood is, is effective and efficacious. It's fully efficacious. I should make this turn here. Jesus' blood is fully efficacious to forgive sin. So that's another juxtaposition of the Old Covenant versus the New. And like I said to you, I think you could pretty much take everything and put it in these two columns. It's either in one column or the other. Yes. Very good question. Very good question. That's a good answer. Well, you know, I'm worth the, what I get paid. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Yeah. Well, she taught me, you know, I mean, uh, if, if there's anything to blame here, my mother taught me all this when I was younger. The PhDs and the degrees and all that stuff just kind of confirm what, what she already taught me. Amen. Amen. All right. So, so guys, we are in very good shape to do 13 next week quickly. There's not much left of 13. And we'll start getting into the test. So what I propose to do, of course, is not to grade you on the test. But I want to go through each of the questions, and I want to see what your answers are. Now, there could be more than one right answer to the question, so I'm open to that. So let's hear what you have to say, and we're going to go through it all. Look, at the test is a progression from Chapter 1 all the way to Chapter 13. So, uh, and, and there's a few little things that we added in there. But uh, you should be able to do fine. So, Pastor, I'm, I'm actually ahead of schedule. On time, fully prepared, under budget, and I, yeah, under budget, and I'll finish <laughs> Hebrews, uh, the whole book of Hebrews in this course, which which uh, I'm very proud of because usually so I don't. I would say listen for the trumpets next week. L listen for the trumpets next week. Yes, no pun intended, right, Pastor? And Reverend, what about our psalms? Oh, sorry. Yeah, your psalm. Yeah, I mean, look at the psalms are just kind of they were there, and and we read through through them, but you know what? It just it just we were overtaken by Hebrews because I had to get I, I if I didn't finish Psalms I'm not going to lose any sleep over that because I was thrown in as extra probably too much it was really made just as an introduction to the course and we could read through it but uh, we'll continue Psalms on through all the through all the other courses <clears throat> and uh, like I said next year two two year course the Synoptic Gospels at least for me I'm doing what you suggest what did I suggest. Daniel and Revelation. Oh, oh that's going to yeah. be fantastic. You guys, did you hear that? Can I, is it, can we early, like, can I sign up early? That's going to be. <laughs> like early registration? That's something that the church, look at, yeah, Daniel and Revelation, awesome. taught by a, a capable theologian, is really, uh, I'm not capable enough. That's why I asked him to do it, because that's really going to be good. Dan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm excited. When I read in the Bible, it says, now child like Jesus. Yeah. I'm struggling with that right now because when I, I'm sitting there and you ask a question, she answers it. I'm trying to find the answer. I'm looking for it. I have no idea what it is. And she's pointing to it and says, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go back. It's frustrating. Look, it, it's, it, it, you know, I mean, I'm but, like to find but we go through the same thing. I mean, it's just, you know, some people are more, you know, perceptive to hearing and teaching than others. And it just, look, it, it takes me time. I was telling my wife the other day, I remember, you know, being in Hunsinger's classroom, I had, I took him every semester. I was at Princeton for four years, and and I didn't know anything. And I was like, I wouldn't ask, I wouldn't know that, what he's talking about sometimes. And then he'd come up to me and say, "You got to ask some questions." Everybody seems like they're lost, and I'm like, "Yeah, I mean, I mean, so it just takes time." And I think the most important thing I could say to all of you in addressing that question is, if we, if you're reading something, you have to read it very carefully and very slowly. And if you read it carefully, look at every question I ask you, unless it's some type of theological, complex theological issue or concept that I'm going over, I'm asking all the answers are in the scripture. I mean, every question I ask, if you read the scripture carefully, these lectures are nothing more than me reading the scripture. Maybe I read the chapter 10 times before I come to class. 
Like I'll read it 10 times over the week. And I'll analyze it. And I'll look at key words. That's why, how would, how would I come up? You guys have read Hebrews probably a lot of times in your life, right? You've all read Hebrews, right? How come none of you ever thought of the concept again and again versus once for all? And it's right because you have to read so carefully. I think a good theologian is nothing more than somebody that reads Scripture carefully and compares Scripture to Scripture in its proper context. I think that's the whole key, right, Pastor? All right, so with that said, we're in good shape, guys. You did a great job. Hebrews is a very complicated and difficult book because basically what you're studying is the Old Testament and the New Testament together. Yeah. Mm. It's not easy. That class, uh, pastor teaching, and look, I wouldn't let, I would let very few people teach <coughs> Daniel or Revelation. Let me just, I would let, of course, Pastor Salvadari, Pastor Kelsey, Pastor Teller, those are about the only three people I'd let teach, the, teach that because it's so difficult and you never want to lead anybody astray. When you have teachers that come up here and say, oh, this is exactly what's going to happen, this is when it's going to happen, this is when it's going to happen, and they know everything, you got to be careful because they could be wrong. Yeah. And then you're leading never, I would rather you say, listen, these are the possibilities here. Choose for yourself, yeah. right? And so, Pastor, it's, it's a class I will look forward to. So with that being said, Pastor, you got plenty of time to go. Okay. And I will uh, see you shortly. Were you able to let him uh, off the... Uh, uh, let me, you know what? I think I left him down there. Let me go see if I can. I think I can get him for you. You want me to get him for you? I'll go, I'll, yeah, I'll, let me try to get him for you. I'll, be, right. I'll be back shortly. Right? Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Not to discourage you, but that's another test. So, uh, oh, oh, <laughs> how is everybody? Good. All right. All right. When, when I hand out the test, uh, I'll give you I'll, I'll give you certain rules on how to do it. All right. So don't panic. Everything is open book. You can use the Bible. All right. You could also cheat. In other words. <laughs> If you if you want to you know pair up with somebody and do it, that's fine too. You learn that way, okay? And um, what I did at the end, and if we get it today, you'll see it. I have uh, my name, phone number, and email address. If you have questions along the way, you can email me. I'll answer the questions. <clears throat> if you don't get it done by the time we end, you can always email it into me. Scan it, email it into me. And uh, How does that work? I'm sorry. How does that work? <laughs> well, we, we we have a young person here who can do, uh, do it. So, uh, listen, Hebrews, very difficult book, great book, right? Jonah was pretty straightforward. Hosea is a little bit more difficult, all right, for a lot of reasons. And um, as we, as we uh, get near the end of Hosea, I think we got through, this is terrible, I should have marked it last week. 10. We got through 10 or 11? Yeah. Yeah, I think we got through 11. Except you gave us homework. Yes. My notes say, Good idea. Uh, my notes say to review chapter 11 and 12, and come away with the uh, theme of 11 and 12 severally, meaning individually, right. and jointly. Okay. Is that correct? That is correct. So then I had to read 12. You had to read 12. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so we left off on 10. Actually, we got through the last, I have a mark here. It's unusual for me. We got through uh, verse 11 of chapter 11. I left verse 12 intentionally. Okay. So, did anybody else do the exercise? Read the chapters and come mm -hmm. up with something? Yes. All right, who wants to go first? Who wants to be brave? Mm -hmm. Who doesn't want to be brave? Okay, man. Well, I mean, I, I'm not saying I did a good job, but I did something. Uh, although, so chapter 11. Although God's children are wretched, God is ultimately perfectly faithful and a God of justice. Chapter 12, our God delivers perfect judgment. And together, what I came away with, chapter 11 and 12, God's time is in three parts. Now, I had help with this. I, I, this was from another study okay. that I saw applied. Okay. God, there's, there's time in three parts. 
our time is chronologically. Like we live, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. Okay. God's time is Cairo's time. Which is not chronologically. All things, he can see all things. And when we're with God, things happen out of our time frame. Okay. And the third type of time is uh, from the beginning to end and the end before the beginning. So that's what I zoned in on when I thought about the two chapters together. Okay. That's what I came away with. Very good. Very good. Uh, just go back to your time. Uh, uh, analysis. <clears throat> Typically, biblical theologians look at time in two movements, okay? One is called, of course, chronological, right, which covers a period of time, and the other one is called syncretic, which means you're looking at a specific point in time. Syncretic moments are crucial moments, all right? For instance, <clears throat> name a, syn a syncretic moment from the New Testament. Jesus died. Yeah, right? The, the cross and the resurrection. That's a syncretic moment. That's a critical moment, correct? Okay. Yes, okay. Um, another critical moment would be the birth of Christ, right? Yeah. In the Old Testament, a syncretic moment would be the giving of the law to Moses, correct? You follow? Mm -hmm. Now, if we look chronologically, chronologically deals with uh, the unfolding revelation of God in salvation. All right? You're with me? Yes. Okay. I feel like I got to do something to wake you up. Right. Um, taking notes. So, yeah, you can take notes. Sure. So, you no, know, Mitch, you did a good job. Who else wants to try it? Anybody else? Uh, good. Um, for 11, I put down um, God will continue to love his people. He'll keep giving him a second. He'll bring him. He wants to bring him back. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it's love. And for 12, I put down that God will judge his people for their sins and ultimately bring them back. Yeah. Yeah. And for the sentence, I put down return to your God. God is always ready and waiting to welcome his people back into his yeah. heart. Yeah. I mean, you both did a great job. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Right? But I want you to notice key phrases. His people. His, His people. people. His people. Remember we talked about the concept of holy war last, mm -hmm. last time? Uh, God will bring holy war against his own people yes. if they refuse to repent. Mm -hmm. Right? He uses other nations to judge them. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, God is God. But yeah, we, we tend to look at this and say, how can God do this? Well, God can do this because he's a holy God. Right? Um, my sister-in-law, who, who's a dear soul, uh, is, is for the second time, she's been homebound a lot because she had a stroke. She, had, she broke a couple of arms and a lot of stuff going on. Uh, but for the second time this year, she's reading through the Bible. Right? Good thing to do. And she'll call me up and she says, why is God so harsh and so and so? And I say, he's not being harsh, he's disciplining. And sometimes he judges evil, you know? I mean, he's God. That's what God does. And we, we tend to put God in a place that we want to create for him, not in a place that he deserves. He's overall, overall, right, Mitch? Didn't, he, didn't we just go over in Hebrews before Pastor came about God disciplines his children who he loves. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Look, there's the tie-in. Wow. Absolutely. He'll discipline him. As a matter of fact, the first thing I wanted to go over with you today was exactly that. Right? <laughs> if you go, if you look at uh, Hosea uh, chapter 11, the last verse. It says, Ephraim has surrounded me with lies, the house of Israel with deceit, and Judah is unruly against God, even against, what's the phrase here? The faithful holy one. Right? That's, that's kind of, I believe that's kind of a key verse for this whole last section. Because, uh, 
I'm not even sure if he uses this words, uh, Paul uses this words, but I've used it uh, when I deal with people who have been backslidden or uh, people who are just going astray. God will never be mocked. He will never be mocked. Okay? And if we mock him, you know what I mean by mock, right? How do we mock God? By being disobedient. We mock him. By saying he doesn't know what he's talking about. I know better. I mean, those are all mocked. He will never be mocked. Uh, mocked. He will always deal with it. Okay? That's why, and we went over this, I know, but in um, 1 Corinthians where it talks about communion, right? Paul says, because you have rebelled against what communion ought to be, some of you have died. Oh. What about Ananias and Sapphira? Right? I mean, that could have all been avoided if they were honest from the get-go. Right? So, God won't leave us to be mocked. Uh, I remember uh, I got a phone call several years back and I'm getting old, uh, that uh, this man wanted to leave his wife because he was entitled to be happy. That was what he told me. Right? So I said, what Bible are you reading? And he says, no, I mean, you know, God wants me to be happy. No, God wants you to be joyful. There's a difference. Amen. There's a difference. Well, I'm entitled to be happy. I said, look, is there anything I'm going to say that's going to change your mind? Oh, no. Why are you calling me? You know? I mean, if you're not going to listen to God, you're not going to listen to me. Right. And he went on and did what he did and ruined a couple of families in the process. Uh, God won't be mocked. And he thought he was going on to greener pastures, pastures, and it wasn't exactly greener. All right? Yeah. It wasn't. In fact, uh, it was. It was a situation worse than he had. So. Um, Proverb three verse five. Can you not on your own understanding? Yeah, yeah. I've I've done what he did. Yeah, I've I, work out. I preached today on the. Uh, in, in John chapter four, the the royal official whose son was dying at Capernaum, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a key phrase in there that says that the uh, royal official took Jesus at his word. Mm -hmm. Right? Took Jesus at his word. When we don't take God at his word, or Jesus at his word, we stand in danger of discipline and judgment. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, let's go to a chapter. I want to get through chapter 12 and 13 with you. And um, then there's only one chapter left, and we'll save that for next week. But can we uh, go around the room if you wish? If you want to read, we'll start with Marie, if you don't mind. Uh, let's see. Chapter 12. Yeah. Chapter 12. Why don't we do five verses each? Okay. We'll start with Marie. Ephraim feeds on the wind. He pursues the east wind all day and multiplies lies and violence. He makes a treaty with Assyria and sends <coughs> olive oil to Egypt. The Lord has a charge to bring against Judah. He will punish Jacob according to his ways and repay him according to his deeds. In the womb, he grasps his brother's heel. As a man, he struggled with God. He struggled with the angel and overcame him. He wept and begged for his favor. He found him at Bethel and talked with him there. The Lord God Almighty, the Lord is his name of renown. But you must return to God, maintain love and justice, and wait for your God always. The merchant uses dishonest scales. He loves to defraud. Ephraim boasts, I am very rich. I have become wealthy. With all my wealth, they will not find in me any iniquity or sin. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt. I will make you live in tents again, as in the days of your appointed feast. I spoke to the prophets, gave them many visions, and told parables through them. Is Gilead wicked? Its people are worthless. Do they sacrifice bulls? 
in Gilgal. Their altars will be like piles of stones on a plowed field. Jacob fled to the country of Aram. Israel served to get a wife, and to pay for her, he tended sheep. The Lord used a prophet to bring Israel up from Egypt. By a prophet, he cared for him. But Ephraim has bitterly provoked him to anger. His Lord will leave upon him the guilt of his bloodshed and will, re will repay him for his contempt. Okay. End of chapter 12. Thank you. What impresses you in reading that? There's some Old Testament theology, uh, references in here, as you can well see, but what, what impressed you about reading that? Anything? Look at verse 1. Chapter 12, right? Ephraim feeds on the wind. He pursues the east wind all day and, mul and multiplies lies and violence. He makes a treaty with Syria and sends um, olive oil uh, to Egypt. What's that telling you? He's turning to other countries. They're deceitful people. Excuse me. Uh, but that should tell you something about where they're looking for their hope. Yeah. Well, and they're looking to Assyria and Egypt in particular for, for their, their hope to pull them out of the mess. And many times, how many times do we think we found hope and it's not from God and we end up in, in worse trouble mm -hmm. you know and that's easy to do these days because everybody's going to promise you the world especially in the world system mm -hmm. and then you, you're, you're disappointed who had the hand up Mitch what is your uh, opinion of uh, the first part of 12 Ephraim feeds on the wind what is what are we supposed to understand about feeding on the wind can, well, can you get nourished by the wind? No. So they're wasting their time. Wasting time. Right. Spinning your wheels. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's the first thing that comes to mind is uh, what Solomon says, you know, that everything is vanity yeah. apart from God. Right? Like chasing the like wind. Like chasing the wind. Right. Like chasing, I mean, you could be hungry, open your mouth outside, and you're not going to get nourished. <laughs> they thought they do. In other words, they're looking in the wrong places for their fulfillment. Right. Right? That makes sense? Yes. Okay. Um, what about um, the reference to Jacob and Esau? Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a murky one, isn't it? He was a usurper. Um, Jacob. Yeah. He was a liar and a deceiver. And got Esau to sell the birthright for what? Maybe lentil soup? Yeah. I, you know. Yes. <laughs> you know, I'm, I mean, lentil soup is good. <laughs> yeah, uh, I love lentil soup, but uh, I mean, there was lying to see not only on Jacob's part, but who else's? His mother. I mean, she was complicit in this, right? Yeah. And you know, I think Jacob and Esau here is a good illustration of trying to get what you want by any means. And that's the position that Israel was in right now. They're trying to get what they want by any means, and the means were corrupt, right? I mean, you don't need a soap opera to read the story of Jacob, his mother, and Esau. I mean, it's all right there, you know? And you see the deceit and the deception and the timing and, and all of this that, that went on for, for what? You know? I mean, and God was even gracious with Jacob going forward. But I'm not so sure he would have been so gracious if Jacob and Esau didn't meet at a later date and kissed and made up, if I could put it that way. Okay? Because Jacob was afraid Esau was going to come back and kill him. True? When you do something wrong, 
you always have to look behind your back. Isn't that right? But if you do something right, you have nothing to worry about. It doesn't mean somebody won't want to hurt you. It just means you know you did the right thing. And so it makes a difference. What about his struggle with the angel? Verse 4. He struggled with the angel and overcame him. He wept and begged for his favor. He found him at Bethel and uh, talked with him there. What do you remember about that? Got his hip out of joint and struggled. Yeah, I mean this was a real struggle, right? And he developed a limp, and God used that limp for what purpose? Probably to keep him humble. You hit it right on the mark. To keep him humble, because until that point he could have said, "I'm a self-made man," right? He got the birthright by deception and lying and and that pattern continued on but then there's a day of accountability he had to wrestle with the angel and he wrestled with the angel until the hip came out and he finally came to his senses who else had a um, issue that they they wrestled with in the new testament to keep them humble. Paul. Paul, right? So, I'll ask you a question. If you know the answer to this question, you're wrong. Okay? Um, what was the thorn in its flesh? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows if it was physical, you know, maybe an eye problem or something like that. Nobody knows if it was spiritual. I mean, he could have been under attack from, you know, in a, a demonic attack, not possessed, but attacked, right? I mean, it could be any number of things. We just don't know. But whatever it was, God used it to keep him humble, right? Because he, he, he has three times what? Remove this thorn from my side. Remove this thorn from my side. Yes? Is it kind of like both physical and spiritual? Could be. You're humble. Could be. Um, I want to suggest that both usually go together. All right. I mean, it's. I have great respect for people with chronic illnesses, who live in pain and you know that type of thing, and maintain their devotion to God. Um, and people like this, they're honest. I mean, they have bad days, but they're just grateful that they have a relationship with God. And that's to be admi admired. You know, listen, I, you know, some years ago, 12, 13 years ago, I broke my arm in three places. And uh, I couldn't even hold the Bible. You know, I mean, it's one of those things where you say, okay, I'm right-handed, so it didn't matter I, I broke this arm, I'm right-handed. No, you missed that, that hand when it's not there. Mm -hmm. uh, and through, through the pain of it, you know, I, 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 I say, God, I need your help. It's hard to focus. It's hard to, to, you know, to keep going. And he did. He, you know, he helped me through it. So who else, who else asked three times for something to be removed? Jesus. Uh, well, what, was, what did he ask? To remove the cup in the Garden of Gethsemane. And particularly in reference to the Passover, it's the cup of wrath. Because he, he bore the full wrath for us. Right? He endured hell for us. Yeah. yeah? Right? Um, verse 5. I go back to just uh, the last part of 4. He found him at uh, Bethel. Bethel means, anybody know what Bethel means? Right. House of bread. House of bread, very good. House of bread, okay. Who who is the manna? Who is the bread? Jesus. Jesus. Right? Jesus. I ought to know that. I went to Bethel University for my doctorate, so I should know that. Um, he went to Bethel, and um, and talked with him there. The Lord God Almighty, the Lord, it is His name of what. Amen. 
renowned. What do you make of that? Anything? None other. Yeah, it's I mean, there, there is none the other. Great I am. The great I am. There, there's a motif uh, again in the in the Bible called the name and fame motif, right? God is proud of His name, and God wants His name to be famous. All right, not because of anything selfish, because if you know the name of God and, and by His very name, you'll start to know His character. All right, and when you know His character. You realize his love, his compassion, his holiness, his righteousness. And the idea is you don't hide that. You want to put that like a light on a hill, a beacon for everybody to know that. That's what Israel was supposed to do. Mm. Right? That was, that was the covenant for Abraham. That you, you need to be a light on the hill for all nations to come. So God wants his name spread. Can we be guilty of trying to spread God's name in a way that does harm to him? Yeah. How? Because people, people do it. Um, Say that again? They, by, they, saying, uh, okay. yeah. by saying one thing and, and your actions not lining up with what you're saying according yeah. to his word. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even the small things, right? I mean, uh, it's a danger we face. Uh, I was using an example uh, this morning. I, when I moved down here, it was culture shock because I was right outside of New York City. You know, I was used to uh, to being up there. Um, that's another way to say I really didn't like it down here. But uh, it, it was it was culture shock. But up there, if you need to work on a house, you call the contractor. They showed up when they said they were going to show up. Down here, it didn't seem like that. Okay. Go I'm sorry? They can go fishing when yeah. they're supposed to show yeah. I have that happen to me. And then in, in my 35 years of pastoring, I've had people in, con in the congregations who have specialties, you know, mechanic, carpenter, and all. And, you know, if you refer somebody to them and they call and they never answer or show up, well, shame on them. You know, that's you know, that's saying you're going to live one way and doing it quite another. That that you know, that detracts from God's name, mm -hmm. because it's like, hey, if you're a Christian, you know, you can't honor your commitments. Uh, so this is the interplay that's going on here. Okay, um, verse six. I'm going to give you the the key to the rest of the book. Okay. I think uh, you hit on it already. But you must do what? Return. Return to God. Return to God. That's repentance, mm -hmm. correct? Maintain what? Uh, and justice. and Wait. do what? Wait, Wait for God. God. All right. Here's my question to you. So if when you read my test, I'll, I'll give you a heads up. Okay? We all know, I think, that returning to God means to repent. But it has to be repentance of sincerity. In other words, the realization that I've hurt God, I've hurt other people, Lord, I want to come back to you, right? And, and usually there's sorrow with that, right? I mean, I, you know, if, if I hurt my wife, I feel bad about it. Yeah? That's part of love, isn't it? So there, there ought to be some sorrow connected with that. Uh, certainly was for Peter when he was confronted. Uh, then it says, maintain love. How do you do that? How do you maintain love? Uh, putting others before yourself is one way. Okay. All right. Yes. Faithfulness. Okay. By being faithful. You need to be faithful to maintain your love for someone or something. Okay, good. All right, you, you're both getting there, okay? How else can you maintain love? Yes? I believe that you love the person unconditionally. However, you know, there's boundaries to that as well and things that you have to um, address. Yeah. Just 
In other words, they don't need to earn your love, basically. Right. But sometimes love has to uh, deal out consequences mm -hmm. for bad behavior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Parents are letting you off the hook, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to enforce consequences, but you're not doing it because you don't love your child. You're doing it because you love your child. Correct? You're all right. But there, there's, there's kind of a central way we can maintain love. Love you know? God. This is one. I be obedient to God. All right. Who said it? Somebody just started to say. Hold. This one. Wait. Well, hold, hold your loved ones accountable and hold yourself accountable. All right. But somebody, somebody just started said, to say, God. love the Lord your God mm -hmm. with all your heart, soul, mind, and might. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? I want to suggest to you, in order for us to maintain love in the way God wants us to do it, we can't do it in our, of ourselves. This has to be a supernatural thing uh, that the Holy Spirit initiates in, in us, uh, gives us the desire to, to do that. It's easy to love people who are nice to us. It's quite another thing to love people who are not so nice to us, right? And that requires supernatural intervention, if I could put it that way. Uh, so in order for us to maintain love, I see at least four things that have to happen in our lives, right? We need to be consistently in the Word, because that's how we find out how God loved us and how we ought to love others, correct? We need to have a consistent prayer life, which is includes confession okay because listen I know many of us here have gone through some deep um, betrayals uh, hurts and those things take time to recover but if we stop bringing them before God then he'll he'll never be able to bring us to a point where we can forgive okay and the other two of course are, Worship and service. Okay. Now, how how would you correlate the, uh, the, the relationship between love and justice? I'm spending a lot of time on this because it's crucial. It doesn't just say maintain love. It says maintain love and justice. What's so important about that? If somebody's unjust, are they loving? Always try to do the right thing. In whose eyes? In God's eyes. Amen. I mean, it's as simple as that. Doing the right thing in God's eyes. It may not be the thing we thought we needed to do, but it's the best thing. Right? Um, I can't emphasize this enough. If you if you look in uh, uh, Mike, see the Micah Malachi where he says that God desires love, justice, and mercy. All right. Um, he doesn't want sacrifices because sacrifices can become just rituals, but he wants love, justice, and mercy. And the only way that gets cultivated is in a dynamic living relationship with God through prayer, through the word, through worship, and, and, and so on and so forth. How about, the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest to you this last phrase is the hardest. And wait for your God always. the most important. It is the most important, right? You pull up to a uh, <coughs> McDonald's. Probably shouldn't be there in the first place, but you, <laughs> you, you pull up to a McDonald's and you're at the call box, right? And you wait 10 seconds. Nobody says anything. What, what do you start to do? Hello? Yeah. <laughs> You wait another 10 seconds, right? 
and then maybe your hello gets a little louder. <laughs> is, is anybody? The point I'm trying to make is we live in a culture that doesn't know how to wait anymore. Everything is so instantaneous and pragmatic. This whole idea of waiting on God is so foreign to us that we need to recapture it again. Because many times when we don't wait on God, we make what? The wrong decision. We make the wrong decision. Amen. All right? Uh, waiting is a problem for us. Uh, part of that is, is, is because of our attention spans, right? Um, when MTV, you know, got rolling and they did the music videos, you see how fast they went from one scene to another in those videos? I mean, through those years, our attention spans just dwindled. Um, I was looking the other day at an old Chevy commercial uh, for the Chevy Impala, I think it was. The commercial was two minutes long, right? And it centered on the family, and, and they were going for a ride on a Sunday afternoon, how comfortable the car was, uh, how smooth a ride it was, and all. Two minutes, that commercial would flop today. Because right. most commercials are 15 seconds. Right? right? We have to <laughs> learn how to wait on God again. So, what does Psalm 46 say? Be still. No, that I am your Lord. I am the Lord. Right? Listen, waiting is no fun. We know that. We get impatient. But not waiting could be even worse. So what do you do when you wait? You still be obedient. You still be obedient to, to, you, to do what God wants you to do. You don't just sit there. Right? Uh, you're obedient to what you know. And then as you keep praying, as, you, as you're in the Word, then as you wait on God, he'll start working in and through you to show you what, what he wants. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right? Uh, all right. Write this down for your test. Okay. See verse 9? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. I will make you live in tents again as um, in the days of your appointed feasts. Uh, and then he says, I, I spoke to the prophets, gave them many visions, and uh, told parables through them. Uh, that is part of what's called the suzerainty, suzerainty covenant, uh, which is the recap, it's a brief recap of how God in his grace worked in Israel's life. Right? It's a central point because you'll see this over and over again. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of what? Egypt. What does that represent? Why, why did he bring them out? Slavery. They were in slavery. They were in bondage. Right? And so he brings them out because he responded to their cries. And he brings them out how? Okay, but how how did he how did he bring him out? Moses. Well, yeah, all of that worked together, right? I mean, Moses, how many times said, "Let my people go," right? And yes, open the sea. Yeah, and he opened. I mean, there were some tremendous miracles here, even the Passover, right? The blood on the on the door. If you didn't do that by faith, then your firstborn male. You know, was was dead by the angel of death. So God, in His grace, breaks them free from bondage. Okay, they were over the other side of the river, and what did they start to do? Murmur and complain. Murmur and complain. All right, uh, just like we do. Like we do. Like we do, uh, we we uh, we sing a song called, well, actually two songs, Ten Thousand Reasons." I don't know if you know that song. Dennis probably knows it, and it talks about you know, "Bless the Lord, O my soul," and all. we need to get in the habit of doing this because it takes it doesn't take a whole lot to complain. 
but it takes a move of the Spirit and the Word for us to rejoice. And this was the pattern in Egypt, right? Uh, what happened to most of the prophets, do you know? They were killed. They killed them. They didn't like what they said and they got rid of them. Right. They killed them. Except for Elijah. Except for Elijah. He was translated. Yeah. Right? I wish I was there. I got him out of there before they yeah. did. They needed a chance. I often wonder what a, what a, what Elisa thought of that, you know. It's a pretty incredible thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you remember the story of uh, uh, Jacob and uh, Leah and Rachel? Yes. Remember the story? Mm -hmm. Right. Jacob wanted to marry who? Rachel. Rachel. How beautiful she was, right? And the father had another daughter that scripture says wasn't so beautiful. <laughs> wasn't so beautiful. She had strange eyes. She had strange eyes. Yeah, I, I don't strange. quite know what that means, but <laughs> she had strange eyes, right? And I mean Jacob was willing to do anything to get Rachel, correct? Seven years working for the father. And then he pulls a switch. Right? Seven more years of working before he gets Rachel. We talk about waiting on the Lord. How long, how long did Moses wait on the Lord? Do you know? 40 years. 40 years. 40 years. We can't wait 40 seconds, no. right? <laughs> how long how long did Jesus was Jesus out in the wilderness? 40, 40 days. 40, 40 days. days. Right? We can't go a day without getting grumpy because we didn't eat. You know? So there's a lot here. There's a lot here. Israel has to relearn what it is to wait upon the Lord. Um, all right, I don't want to get too far. Uh, Pastor Rob gave you the tests, right? Mm -hmm. I, What's the return date? Well, go through it as best as you can. We'll start going next week because the last uh, chapter 13 and 14 kind of sum everything up, and we'll look at that together. Uh, but again, This is open book, all right? Don't be afraid of answering a question, all right? Uh, you, can, you can cheat, all right? You can get together if you want and, and look at the questions. They're not real difficult, I don't think, uh, questions. But what I tried to do was go through both books, Hosea and uh, Jonah hit the main issues. Um, there was one question that I did not put in there that I'll tell you next week. All right? And then I'm just going to ask you to wrestle with that question. Any questions for me? Yes, Marie. I do. On, on chapter 12, when it says in verse 4 that he struggles with the angel, and that doesn't say angel of the Lord, but do you think that could have been a struggle with just an angel, or could it have been... Pre-incarnate Jesus. Yeah. Well, I, I think it specifically says uh, Michael, the archangel. Yeah. Does it? I don't, I, my Bible's in the car. If it, it's referencing, most of the time, the theophanies, Jesus is not wrestling or doing something right. physical. He's just appearing. So yeah. right, probably, I mean, I'd have, to, I'd have to look at the scripture. But it's yeah. I'll, look, I'll look, but I, I, I think it's, it's <coughs> Michael, the archangel. All right, I think we're good, right? So, uh, so we're on schedule. So, what do we have? Two more classes left. That's it. So, I'm going to do 13 next week, fairly briefly, and then we'll start getting into the test, and then we'll do the test next week and the week after, and then we'll be done. And Pastor, right on schedule, and then we'll start preparing for next year. Um, are you going to do that class in one year or two years, Pastor? Two. 
Well, let's talk, we'll talk about it because yeah. I'm, I, we may have maybe we could do both of them for the two year course. It's a two year course yeah. in the Synoptic Gospels and in the, uh, in Daniel and Revelation. It would be tough, I think, to do it all in this. Okay, time. that's good. That would work out good. All right, any other questions? We're going to let you go, and thanks for coming, and uh, it's a nice Sunday we had today. Very good educational, spiritual, right? Day in church. All right, guys, good seeing you. Thank you both. Yeah. Thank you.